please be standing for the entry of the body. Opening hymn this morning is in the uh, little black book in your pew. Uh, Change my heart, oh God. challenges in our lives. And now, as the Father taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thy own kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Lord's words to us this morning are taken from 1 John, the third chapter, second verse. Yes, dear friends, we are already God's children right now, and we can't even imagine what it's going to be like later on. But we do know this, that when he comes, we will be like him as a result of seeing him as he really is. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Somebody get an outline there on the back, and you see there's a lot of blue highlighted things and under his scriptures. Well, I have stuck on the on the table in the narthex for you as you leave, because I don't want you looking at it while we're going to the church and when we worship today is all of those scriptures for you to go home and take them home and go through all of this and we be looking at it and study it for the things together because we're in this fourth sunday of this series we're doing on having daring faith today we last week we were talking about daring to believe this week we're talking about daring to imagine you know you know and that's one of the things that's there one of the greatest gifts that god has ever given to us in all of this time and for to given to us to be able to do is the gift of imagination. He's given us that ability. Uh, it's an ability to see things in our minds uh, and to think and to create uh, little pictures in our minds. So God gave us this gift of imagination. The reason that you and I have this gift is because, guess what? God has the greatest imagination that ever was. And we can't wrap our mind around the greatness of that. But the, as we read in the Bible, we find that God's imagination, I mean, he imagined the entire universe. Now, I, I love to look at the stars, and I like to look at what's going on in the Milky Way and how large the Milky Way is. You realize we're just a little speck in that Milky Way when you see it at night across the place. And you can see it at certain parts at certain times of the year, particularly if you're in certain areas where it's dark enough, like in the Ozarks at times. But to see how small we are, but imagine God imagined that before it occurred, and then bingo. You and I can read in the book of Genesis how he did it by thinking about it and realizing it and imagining it, and he knew it was going to happen, and he had the ability to bring it together and because he thought it up. Uh, and so he imagined it in advance of all of this, and you and I, if we read in the Bible, it doesn't call it him having imagination. It calls it God's forethought. All right, so that means he was thinking of it long before it ever come about, and that's one of the things that I want us to think about today. Having the ability to dare to imagine, uh, we're most like that our times when we realize it, we're more like our Creator God when you and I are being created. Does that make sense? When you realize that you're being creative and that creativeness comes from God and we're being like God. Because if you read that scripture, it says when Jesus comes, we're going to know him because we're going to be like him. And so that means if he's like the father then and we're like the son, that means that, hey, we're in that part of it in our life as well. So God has given us the ability to create with our imagination. And when we use our imagination for good, God smiles. I'll assure you, he's smiling at times when we do that. But see, everything starts with imagination. Nothing becomes reality unless first someone, th excuse me, thinks it up. Our nation came about because people thought it up for coming about. The vaccine that we're all taking right now it got here because someone had the imagination to say this would work if we do these things and that's what we have today. And so that's creativeness that comes with us and we realize it. But you know, every you know, think about all the great companies that come about. I was looking at something not long ago with Steve Jobs and how he started Apple and you know and how he started the garage and that image, how large it is now. You see it's gotten wild. Some of us are old enough to think about another product that came out of Atlanta for many, many years, and that was called Coca-Cola. And when it first started, we think, oh, what's going on? And in too long, it's gotten astronomical. But look at Disney World. It started in Disneyland, and, and over the last 50 years, imagine his imagination. It's hard for us to grasp it. I remember what Art Linkletter said when Walt Disney took him out to see this land outside of L.A., and he thought he was, man, you're, you're out of your nothing. It was crazy. This is wilderness. 
And Walt Disney says, but you don't see what I see here. And that was where Disneyland came about because of an imagination. Uh, and, it, you know, every piece of art, I was looking and wrote an article not long ago on one of my dailies about Van Gogh and what he painted and what he saw. But I tried, and I got to go to his museum in Amsterdam, and we've seen what his imagination created. And so that was it. So when you think about that, or think about the Rembrandts that you see, the masterful piece of art has to be in an imagination before it becomes a product and reality. Think about the beautiful notes. You heard music being sung while ago, the beautiful notes are there, and you're realizing, where does all this come from? And I got to looking. I love Mozart. You like Mozart? I can just go wild with this fifth symphony and be flat, and then just, wow. It was all from his imagination. And when you realize that, or how many of you sung Handel's Messiah? That all was his imagination. Those are what comes to us in our lives. So without imagination, we couldn't even make a decision in our life. Everything that has been created on this third rock from the sun by human beings started with the imagination of someone's mind. Someone came up with that. Uh, imagination, realizing the fact is, it's a tool. Did you know that? God gave us this tool, this imagination, and it's to be used, for, it can be used for good, or it can be used for bad. Now, I'm praying that we have imagination, we use it for good, but like any other gift from God, whether it be fire or water or anything else, or anything for that matter, God has given us a gift that we can make it for good or we can screw it up. We're good at that. We can make it bad and we shouldn't, but that's what happens. So the Bible, as I put on the outline there, gives us three different categories of imagination. We should not imagine then, one of the things is that there are some things that you cannot imagine and there's some things that we should imagine in our lives. Those three thoughts this morning as we think about it. So the Bible says that worry is a misuse of imagination. I wrote you a thing on that in the, my, one of my dailies this past week because the reason I wrote it to you is all of a sudden I caught myself sitting there in my study worrying about what I was going to preach on. And I'm in my prayers and he sort of slaps me like Gibbs did and says, hey, have some attention. Think about it. You don't have to worry. That's using your imagination in a rather obscure way. So don't waste your time doing that in, in your life. But also we can, you know, the brain isn't big enough at times to really understand what we can't do. I mean, there are things that we should do. But the Bible says if you and I misuse uh, by worrying or by Revenge, those are imagination tools that we shouldn't be using every day in that. But if you and I read more and what we find out in the Bible telling us, the reason God, you thought about the flood, the reason God created the flood was the fact that evil imagination had taken over the world. And it looks sort of like where we are today. He said it won't flood again, but look out for the hellfire and brimstone. It may be coming. I don't know. But the fact being is, he says, for us to think about it, the reason that. So many people are, are using their imagination in very, very dark, dark ways today. Uh, I was reading the other day about the black internet. You know, that's on the other side, but I have no idea where that is. I couldn't even get there if I tried. But I was reading about it, and I'm talking about all of the things that come out of that black internet. And I'm thinking, wow, we're using this great imagination to pull out all of this junk in life. And so when we're looking at this, there are some things though that you and I cannot imagine. You and I cannot imagine the fact of just how great God is or how large God's mind is. And look at, when I said look at the universe, look at the Milky Way, and look at what we are, just think about it. We're just a small fraction of God's greatness. And when I look at the stars and when I look at what's out there, I begin to realize I can't wrap my mind around it. There's no way I can imagine that uh, part of what God has done. So you can't imagine just how much God loves us either. That's the other thing. You and I said, well, God loves me. Well, how much does God love me? And when you think about that, can, you know, sort of like I love you a bush to let a peck and hug around the neck. Well, guess what? God's bigger than that. He gives us love that's far beyond that. And so that's what you heard in today's text is that just how large God is and how much he loves us. 
And there's another thing that you and I can do, we can imagine, it's what, what Paul wrote to the, to the church at Philippi when he said, fix your thoughts. And look at this is what he's saying to us. Fix your thoughts. That means to concentrate. That means to focus. That means to meditate. That means to imagine. So fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That's the kind of imagination God is seeking us to get involved to. So as we learn about God's inspired imagination, how it can make a major difference in our lives. And not only in our lives, but in our relationships to others in their lives. And the way that we think about that is, and I've got them all listed on there for you, and you can follow along, or I hope that you can just understand where we're coming from today, is that think about our families, think about our careers, think about our lives, Think about God. Think about everything in there, all around us. Let our imaginations just take over and get going. And our imagination, if you look at it and look at the fact being is, shapes our lives. And in other words, the way you and I think is going to affect the way you and I feel. And the very way we feel is going to affect the way we act. Have you ever acted like, have you ever felt puny? are disgusted, and somebody's trying to say, what's wrong with you? Oh, don't leave me alone. You know, we, that's how we act. And he says, wait a minute, with that kind of feeling and with that type of imagination, it shapes our lives. Proverbs 23, seven, I have on there for you is, we ask, he says these things to us, as we think in our hearts, so we are. That's sort of gets at us. But I'm all my favorite theologian of the 20th century was C.S. Lewis, and I'm sure many of you have read his Chronicles of Narnia and some of the others, but I've read some of the other things, and I get one of his writings every morning, and I read it. And he says this words, imagination is the organ, O-R-G-A-N, the organ of meaning. In other words, that's where it comes from, our imagination. And imagination is the simple. It's essential for us to be living by our faith. We have to really imagine. It's sort of like the song the young man wrote and made such a great hit with, I can only imagine. That's where we are. We can only imagine, but in imagining the essentials of living for you and me is that, and it comes out of, how many of you have read Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the first verse? And when you think about that, because it says, what is faith? Because we try to imagine just what faith is, right? But here the writer of Hebrews says to us, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. That's faith. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. That's what faith is about. That's what our imagination does. That's how it pulls us and causes our living. Cannot yet see, he says. See, God has two ways of you and I see. You and I can see with our physical eye. Of course, mine are not working too good lately, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to go get some assistance from the optometrist to get them back to seeing better. But the fact is, we have physical eyes to see, and we have imaginations in our minds. So we see in two different ways that God has created for us, and we need to focus on the things in that are that will last for us that we actually can't see with our physical eyes and we can we have to imagine them and it says faith is leading in those things we cannot see that's I don't know you God's so big I can't see him at times can you and so that we have faith that he's there and we get to imagine him because when you realize great lives are built around great dreams and dream, dreams are imaginations. That's where we come from, and that's what we develop with and see about it. And during this series on daring faith, I want to help us to unlock our imagination. I want us to, as a pastor, I'm sort of praying out loud for all of you every day what Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, I mean, at, at uh, Ephesus, uh, Ephesus. He wrote these words. When you and I think of this, here's what he says to you and me. And that's where we're coming from today is the fact that my God 
enlightens the eyes of your mind so that you can see hope that his calling holds for you. That's my prayer for all of us. That I can, we can see that God's enlightening us in our minds and doing this. So I want us together uh, to discover God's dream. That's why we're in this series and that's where we're going with it. And I said from the very start of this that when I was going to it, I'm going to push us. We're going to push our faith. We're going to push ourselves into it. And I'm going to be very strong in pushing. I'm going to be like that defensive end trying to get to that quarterback. I'm going to be pushing like that in this series and so I hope that you're there with me. So today I challenge you and me for us to discover God's dreams for our lives. Have you ever wondered and thought about it? God, what is your dream for me? Yeah, I know I'm a preacher and I'm doing this sort of thing, but God, what is really your dream for me? And he has to say, if you'll shut up and listen, I will tell you. And most of the time, that's where we are. We're not listening. And he's shouting it out to us. And God's dream for our lives is bigger than our dreams could ever be. We can't imagine what God is dreaming for us. You're realizing his dream for us is exponentially larger than anything we can imagine that, that our dreams are. Ephesians 3 says God can do anything. Woo! Far more than we can ever imagine. More than we can imagine. That's where we are today. So I want you to write this down. You got a pen there. Let the size of my God, this is your words, I'm putting in there, your words there. My God, let the size of my God determine the size of my goal. Most of the time in our lives, when we set our goals, we never stop to think, God, is this the direction and this is the size you want this goal to be? We have to. We do it. And even at our age, and I look around you, look, some of, most of you are younger than I am. But when the fact being is, we all still have goals. We have futures. I don't know about you, but I've got a goal that God keeps saying, yeah, you're going to have to give up on it. And that's to lose weight. And I say, whoa, 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 time out, God. He said, no time out, Bob. Get your head squared away, and it will happen. You see, I have not accepted that. And I'm just like you, because I live in a glass house, and I'm not about to throw any stones. In fact, being is, we all have goals that we're wanting to get at. We have areas that we want to become, and so God will help us determine them too. But the major problem that you and I have is we have doubts. And doubt is an enemy of imagination. I have doubts in my mind that when I step on the scales every Sunday morning before I step in the shower, I have doubts in my mind that I'm going to get the level I want to be. Guess what? My doubts went out. You see, I can practice what I preach. We all do. So doubts and fears neutralize what God wants to do in our lives. We, you know, it's sort of like when God called me to go into the ministry. I said, are you sure? Because I had questions. I had doubts. You see, it takes courage to imagine. And that's the wonderful thing about, I just see this wonderful heart. Because doubts are meant to be doubted, but beliefs are meant to be believed. In other words, we believe in them, and our imagination in our lives is either going to be governed by fear, or our imagination is going to be governed by faith. And that's the important part for us. By faith. And the choice is ours. You and I have that choice. So if we and we think about it, and you think, well, Bob, how, if I do all this, how will I refuel God's dreams for my life? And God does that for us. You see, one of the great things he was, remember what Christ told the disciples when they all got worried? And they all started to say, What were you you're leaving us? He said, Time out. The Father is going to leave you an advocate. He's going to come. Because you see that the disciples were in doubt in that moment. But guess what? Pentecost proved them wrong. They got rid of their doubts. But so we are fueling, in fact. God gives us two sources to energize our dreams. And we don't run out of gas like I did with my lawnmower the other day. We don't run out of gas. You see, God gives us 
his own spirit. God gives us this Holy Spirit that not only is given to us, but dwells within us. And that's fuel within itself. And he gives us his word. Have you heard the thing about it? And I've written some things about it recently on promises. You know, we say that that person is a person of their word because there's a promise they make. The Bible has 7,000 promises from God to us. And yet we doubt it. But there they are. 7,000 of them. But see, he gives us his word and the promises that we find. So I, I gave you a couple of verses there in your, on the outline that you'll find when you get ready to leave in there from John, the 14th chapter. I'm looking at that part of it when you realize it says, I ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. That helper is the spirit of truth. You know him because he lives with you and will be in you. You see, that's the marvelous thing about it. We keep forgetting it. What I want to do is I want us to get our abilities to dare to imagine just what God has in store for us and get on board in all of this. And we realize it. And then when you look at Psalms 119, you got to realize that's the longest psalm in the Bible, right? You're aware of that, okay? Oh, and he says, open my eyes to see the wonderful truth in your law. Help me understand the meaning of your commands and I will meditate on your wonderful miracles. You see, that's what we're about. And the key to all of that is the fact being is have daily quiet time. Do you realize if you go to bed at night talking to God and get up the next morning talking to God, imagine what's going to happen in our lives every day. And we're asking for help and opening our eyes. And if we do all of that, we wake up opening to and understanding the will of God, then God's will will be clarified in our vision as we look at life, what God has got us to do. And we're getting there at times. When you and I realize God's dream for us, the reason that you and I can't see God's vision is, you ready for this? And at our age, I'm going to tell us that we got to grow up. For us to be able to see God's vision, we've got to grow up. We've got to grasp it at times. You see, if a dream is from God, it will be able to connect you and me to his church and to the world and to all that's in it. And that dream is there. And you see, God has this overarching plan for all of us. And he says it there in Mark, the eighth chapter. If you try to keep your life for yourself, uh-oh, you will lose it. But if you give it, give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. That's where we are. And that gets us to bringing up some more questions. To start with is on our journey to find God's dream about our lives. We have questions about all of that. But don't worry about it. Did you realize that? Don't worry about it. Anybody says, well, Bob, look at my age and where I've gotten to. And the fact is, it's only me. I said, whoa, whoa, time out. God is not in a hurry. He's got us exactly where he wants us to be. No matter what our age, no matter where we are, we're where we ought to be because God has us there. He brought us here today. You're here. We're hearing this message today because God wants us to hear. And then when you realize that sort of thing there, there are several questions I have to ask. One of the questions is, the three questions that come up with, I have to ask myself, and I'll bring you ask yourself, is beginning with concerning what God's dream is for you and me individually. And the question is, what if? What if God, if I were to do this and do that, what if, what's gonna happen? Try to see. Or the other one might be, uh, uh, why not? Why not do this? Why not try it? Why not see that this is the direction God is taking us? And the other one is, fact for you and me is, why not me? And why not now in our lives? And that's what God is working on us to be. You see, it's because God is wanting or waiting on you and me as his children that we are just, Imagine the situation 
And maybe God wants to use us in ways we haven't even considered yet, and we've never ever given those ways any thought to use us to make a significant difference in the world, in some part of the world today. You see, God is looking for people who are tired of small thinking, petty living, weak-willed goals, and self-centered dreams. God is looking for those to reach out. And maybe God is saying that to us today as we take the moment and think about this lady whose pictures are here in front of us. Do you imagine what Becky thought? What Becky did? I want you to hear the stories. And then you can say, wow, imagine. Would you please come and speak? I want you to hear about her. Most of us don't know her. She wasn't our member for very long. Some of us know her from over the years. Remember the round robins? We had those, and you were at Dyer Springs, and those were the times. Listen and embellish the story. And let your imagination wrap around Becky Tony. Good morning. My name is Leanne, and I have the honor to tell you, the honor today to tell you about the amazing relationship that I had with Mike and Becky. I absolutely cannot imagine going anywhere <laughs> the last 48 years without the millions of memories I have of my aunt. As I was preparing today, I read about eulogies. They say you should have a little sad, they should have happy. So I want to start with the sad and get this out of my system. I need you to know I hate cancer. December 23rd, 2019. My family heard the words nobody wants to hear. She had stage four pancreatic cancer with meds to lungs. My 90 year old aunt was an amazement to anyone who had battled pancreatic cancer. Most pancreatic cancer families get three months with their loved ones. God bless my family. We had 20 months. I was the one who got the pleasure to unhook her every two weeks from chemo and disconnect her for. She would always hug me and say, what did I do to deserve you as my angel and nurse? And I would always say to her as I hugged her, what did I do to deserve you as my aunt? A month ago, my best friend, dad's best friend died. At the funeral, Dr. Bob's daughter shared a song lyrics from Casting, Casting Crown. Their lyrics literally punched me in the gut. I share these with you today because life is short and time is precious. What I've learned from pancreatic cancer is what you think is important in life is probably not. Spend more time with your loved ones. Here are the lyrics. If I'd only have known the last time, would be the last time. I wouldn't have put off the things I had to do. I would have stayed a little longer, but I'm a little tired. Now what I'd give for just one more day with you. Because there's the one here in my heart where something's busy. And they tell me that it's gonna go with time. But I know you're in a place where all your wounds have been erased, and knowing yours are healed is healing mine. The only scars in heaven, they won't belong to me and you. There'll be no such thing as broken, and all will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile, now even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are the hands that hold you now. I know the road you walked was anything but easy. You picked up your shares of scars along the way. Oh, but now you're standing in the sun, you fought your fight, and your race is run. The pain is all a million miles away. There's not a day that goes by that I don't see you. You live in all the better parts of me. Until I'm standing with you in the sun, I'll fight this fight and this race I'll run until I finally see what you can see. So now to share the happy. How in the world do you sum up 48 years of, of memories into just a few minutes? Well, you know. So I tried to find the memories I want to share with you about my Aunt Becky, and trust me, it was hard. After I was born, I pretty much spent every other weekend with my Aunt Becky and my Aunt Sissy. I loved to hear Becky tell me stories of how she would read to me at night, how she would say be so sleepy, she'd say she was so sleepy and that she'd start making up the words on the page. 
she said, I'd always kind of tap her on the shoulder and say, and stop her and say, Becky, that's not what that page says. I love when she would tell me how even when we were apart as a little girl that we talked on the phone, apparently we played I Spy. She would ask me, do you know how hard it is to play I Spy when you have no clue what a three-year-old is looking at? My mom says we spent hours on the phone. Every Saturday, she took me to the store to buy a new doll because apparently I carried the dolls under my armpit and the head would fall off and she couldn't sew it back on. Or she would buy me a new pair of shoes. She loved to share with people how she bought me a pair of boots and I refused to take them off. So her and Sissy had to literally stand me on the counter so the lady could scan the boots and they had to take the tags off before I would leave the store. She attended every graduation from high school to my bachelor's to my master's and then to my doctorate. When I graduated with my doctorate, she squeezed my neck and said to me, do you know how proud of you I am and how I love that now I can tell my niece is a doctor. I've been dancing since the age of four. I have to give Sissy and Becky the credit for my love of dance, performing and being on stage. They always have told me how I would stand in front of the TV and sing and dance, they would turn the TV off. They would turn off, watch, clap, holler, they egged me on. Last year was the first year Becky wasn't there to watch me dance. All I can say is stupid COVID. Even when I bought the dance studio, she attended every dance recital and every single dance competition. I owned the studio for seven years. Twice a week, I would pick Sissy and Becky up. We would head to the studio where all the kiddos and parents fell in love with them. Oh, the memories I could just share with you in those seven years. My love for travel came from my aunts. We've been all over. Some of my favorite places were we went to Arizona, 20 hour, hour car ride for a dance convention. In typical fashion, I'm pretty sure Sissy and Becky made friends with everybody at the hotel. Numerous trips to Branson. Um, probably one of my favorite stories is one night I asked him, hey, let's go ride go-karts. Now I need you to keep in mind they were in their 70s and never did they say no. They both said, let's do it. I think we laughed so hard till we cried. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Becky told us she peed her pants. And this is when we had three members trying to get her out of the go-kart. So I don't have pictures of that. I really wish I did. We once went to San Antonio. Now let me back up for a second. I have a huge purse love for purses. Um, so much so that Becky would, I'd come in the house, she could always tell that she'd say, did you buy another purse? Okay. So she tried to convince me that I needed to start my own purse rental because I needed to start being able to pay for these purses. <laughs> so before we left for San Antonio, I'd been in Dillard's and I saw this beautiful, it was a big, it's called Big Buddha Purse and I was in love with it. It was a little out of my price range and I wasn't willing to pay the money, but man, I loved it. So we stopped in Dallas, had dinner, and there was a Ross dress for less next door. I told them, let's go in, I just want to look. I always hear Ross for dress, dress for less has more, better things than TJ Maxx. So we would walk in, as typical, we all go our separate ways. Where do I go straight to the purses? What do I find but the big bird of purse? And it's on sale. So I snatch it up, I quickly find Becky in the store. I couldn't contain my excitement as I start to tell her, this is the purse I told you about at Dillard's. Where she would tell me I didn't need the purse, but I was gonna buy the purse. <laughs> so we get up in line, she stands with me, and I hear the lady in front of us, the cashier, ask her, so ma'am, are you a senior citizen? Because you get a discount. <laughs> so I grab Becky's arm, I shove the purse over it, and I said, you are paying for this purse. Here's the cash, because you get yet another discount. So it was our turn to buy the purse. She walks up, and you just have to know her. Everything was very over-animated. So she throws the purse over. She turns to the lady, and she says, So do you like this purse? I hear it's a big Buddha. You don't think this is too old for my age, right? Because I am a senior citizen. <laughs> so um, needless to say, we walked out that day. We paid $26 for the purse. And I'm pretty sure at Gillard's it was $300. <laughs> so um, my other favorite memory to share with you is, when I moved home from Memphis, I lived down the street from Sissy and Becky, and I had a little schnauzer named Chloe. Becky and Sissy told me to bring the dog down to their house so that she didn't have to stay alone during the day. So every day for six years, I literally would put the dog in the car, like taking a kid to school. We would drive down the street, I'd pull in the, ha in the, in the driveway. Sissy would open the garage, I'd open the door, the schnauzer would get out and run in the house and get back in the bed with Becky. <laughs> now, interesting fact about Chloe. When we moved home, she weighed 18 pounds. She was the standard weight for a schnauzer. 
So a couple years in, I took her to see the vet, and the vet says to me, she's got to go on a diet. She weighs 26 pounds. you got to cut back on what you're feeding her. And I'm a little bit puzzled in the vet's office because I'm thinking, I feed her twice a day, and I feed her dog food. I don't feed my dogs off the table. I always ate dinner with Susie and Becky. Um, I'd come home, pick up Chloe, and I'd always eat dinner with them. And so I start telling them about Dr. Mike. I knew something was off. So they begin to inform me that whatever Becky ate is what Chloe ate. <laughs> so my schnauz are like Cheerios and Cheetos and cookies and bananas, and I don't know, I think just about every flavor of yogurt. I'm really not sure if the Chloe diet killed her more or Becky more. New Year's 2012, I've been at work. Told mom on the way home, she begged me to come over. Don't spend New Year's by yourself. I said, no, I just want to go home and crash. I'm tired. I just want to be alone. So I get home. I frantically call mom back because I'm pretty sure that Chloe's having a stroke. Mom, Sissy, Becky, and I spent New Year's Eve at the emergency bed with, with Chloe. And that tells you about our family. So five or four of us in the emergency bed with this little schnauzer. So um, mom, we spent, I get, I go out of town. And for some reason, mom kept Chloe. I don't know where Sissy and Becky were because they didn't have the dog. So I get home and I call Becky crying and I said, Mom has said that if I go out of town again and she keeps the dog, she, she can't deal with her disorientation. She had her head would kind of lean to the side and Mom said she's going to put her down. Becky always had the best way of making me feel better, so we get off the phone. Next day I'm sitting on the couch with the dogs all in tow. I have three. And um, Sissy and Becky would open the garage, come in the house like, you know, that was normal. And I said, so what do I owe this great visit today? And Becky says to me with that hand on the hip, I wish you could have seen, and she said, I've come to get Chloe. She's going to live with me. And I said, well, okay. And she said, because here's how this is going to go. If sister puts that dog down, then I'll have to put sister down, and I'm not going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so my dog went to live with Sissy and Megan for two more years. The dog lived to be 17, so I guess the Cheerio Cheeto diet worked well. She went to Yellowstone, to the beach, and daily drives. I'm pretty sure that dog has been on more trips than most people have. I could go on and on and on, but our time is limited here, and there's one more thing I want to share with you, which is a takeaway. Have you ever been asked when you die, what is the legacy you want people to remember you by? So what would Le Becky's legacy be? Becky never met a stranger. She loved everyone, and she loved unconditionally. She impacted more people than she will ever know. I wonder how many people have a quilted, cro uh, crochet um, quilt by Becky. There's a ton of people out there. So as we began, my husband and I began to share the news of Becky's death. People bombarded us with calls and texts, and I just want to read a few so you can understand what her legacy is. She was precious. Loved me some Aunt Becky. I know she's going to be truly missed. She was an amazing person. She was the best. She was such a special lady. I, gave great, I have great memories of her. She was the sweetest lady. You know we love some Aunt Becky. She was truly an angel. Your Aunt Becky was such a wonderful lady. I always enjoyed our talks at the studio. Aunt Becky is a very special angel. She was a wonderful lady, and I know how proud she is of you. My heart is broken into a million pieces. She was so fun and full of life. I loved seeing her at dance. She loved watching everyone dance and cheering them on. One of the dance uh, the kids that I taught at the studio said, that lady shaped me into the person I am today. For those of you who didn't know Becky, I'm pretty sure this would be Becky's legacy as God has called her home after 90 years here on earth. This is a legacy we can all strive for. Work for a cause, not for applause. Live life to express, not to impress. Don't strive to make your presence known, just make your absence felt. Becky's been gone for a month. Her absence is felt every day. My husband and I just came back from vacation. I'm pretty sure we cried every day because we couldn't understand that she wasn't here, that we weren't going to pick up the dogs from her house, that we weren't going to go eat Mexican food, that she wasn't going to show up in our driveway. So there's a big hole in my heart where we've all been together and she's not there. My family was together yesterday. It just didn't feel right her not being there. So her absence is definitely felt. 
I keep saying, Becky, maybe we can skip Thanksgiving this year because you won't be at the table. Maybe we put off family dinners for a while because your spot will be empty. How do I tackle my 49th birthday knowing she's not going to call me and sing happy birthday to me? How do I go to your house and her not stand at the door surprised to see me when she knew I was coming? I don't think I want to eat fried okra or chicken and dumplings for a while because she always cooked them for me and we always ate together. But what gives me comfort, friends, is that in some day I will see her again. I know that when I cross the pearly gates, she will be standing there waiting for me. And I can't wait to hug her neck and tell her how much I miss her. Thank you for having, letting me have this opportunity to share my memories of my Becky. Back in 2006 and 7 was the first time I really met Becky. Not really met her. My son, Mark, had met her. He came home one day with this big sack of food. I was a widow woman at the time, and he was living with me, and I guess he went by the pantry and picked up food for us. And I said, Mark, what are you doing with that sack of food? I went right by Geyer Springs Methodist Church. Their pantry's open, and they gave me this big sack of food. And I said, but we don't need that. We can still buy food. I think we should take it back. Oh no, I met Miss Becky, and Miss Becky told me I can have this sack of food, and she's gonna give me another sack. And I said, oh, Mark. And he said, we have a pack. She's giving me the food, and I'm cooking it for the homeless. I think he did that, and she did that for well over a year. A lot of homeless people was on Geyer Springs Road. She would give him the food, he'd spend a day or two to cook it and take it to them. They stopped because the city came, cleaned the underbrush out of where they were staying, and moved the homeless people away. But this is the type of person that Becky was. She was always wanting to feed the homeless, to give food to people, to prepare the pantry. And I understood at Gar Springs, the pantry was her food. Not that she was always there, but the food was always there. When she came to Maplevale Church about three months ago, she had been here and visited a number of times. I was excited and she wanted to join our church. I was more excited. Unfortunately, because of her situation, she did not get to get into our church's program or to work with any of us as she had at our Springs. But one thing she did give to us, she shared love with us, she was always concerned about the people that were on our prayer list, even though she was on that list. She never thought about herself, but she always wanted other people to be taken care of. She was a humble, faithful servant. She never wanted people to know what she had done. But someone did know. Jesus knew exactly what she did, and one day, about a month ago, he came and told her, you have completed the purpose that I set for you. Now, I am going to take you home with me. She had told me she was ready. She trusted him, and she knew that he would take care of her. He took her to her eternal home, and today we thank God for having known someone like Becky. She was witness, she was love, and her legacy, in my opinion, to all of us is share that love and be a witness for Jesus Christ. That's what I did, and that's what I'd like for you to do. We thank God that we were able to know Becky, and he gave us someone like her 
to feel the love that he feels for all of us. she and Kobe Carroll came here. She said, we're going to join this church. About two weeks before she made her transfer of her membership, she was sitting at, we were over in the Fellowship Hall having worship over there. And she was having a real hard time, even with her walking, with her cane and everything. And I said, Becky, how are you? You know what she told me? It's well with my soul. So listen and enjoy and give thanks for having the opportunity of knowing, or at least meeting, Becky in your life as Meta sings for us. It is well with my soul. face to shine upon you. Be gracious unto you as he was to Becky. In your going out and in your coming in. In your lying down and in your rising up. In your labor, in your leisure, in your laughters, in your tears. Until we can be like Becky and stand on that day when there is no sunset and no dawning and hear, welcome home, good and faithful servant. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now turn to all those around you and say, I love you. And there's not a thing you can do about it. There's a guest in the house, so at least acknowledge and welcome them and ask them to come back with our Turn to all.